All right. Um, I tried this once and I felt like the camera angle was pretty bad. And so we're trying this again. And I think that this is much better. You can see I'm like slightly tilted or something, but it's better than it was. And I think uh, I feel good about this. So let's just start over. Um, I've already kind of talked through this, but I wrote some stuff on the board, but nothing super significant yet. Uh, so what we're talking about today is section 22. Uh, which is on properties of continuous functions. And we have a definition. And the definition says that a function f from d to r is bounded if it range f of d is a bounded subset of r. Okay. And then also f is bounded. This is kind of like a similar definition uh, for a function being bounded. If there exists a number capital M in r, such that the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to m for every x in the domain. So basically two ways of thinking about this is if the range is bounded, then we say that the function is bounded. And also if there's like a capital M up here and a, a negative M down here where every value of the function fall below the, uh, in between those two values, then we say the function is bounded. And this isn't really that new of a concept, the concept that we could have a bounded set, but we've never really talked about a function being bounded. So we've talked about sets being bounded. We maybe haven't talked about functions being bounded, but here we are and this is what we mean. So here's an example, a nice step function. This step function is bounded because uh, all of its range values uh, fall in between like an upper bound and a lower bound. Or you could say there's a capital M up here and a negative M down here where all the functional values fall between. Similarly here, F of X equals one over X, our nice hyperbola uh, is not bounded, right? So here's an example of a function that is not bounded. Uh, obviously it goes up to infinity down to negative infinity, very not bounded, right? Okay, so now that brings us to our first theorem of the day, and that's theorem 22.2. And theorem 22.2 says the following, let D be a compact subset of R, and suppose that the function F from D to R is continuous, all right? Then, f of d as a function, or basically f of d as the range of the function, is itself a compact set. Now, I suppose since we're a little bit rusty after the break, we should think for a second about what does it mean to actually be compact. And remember, there's a couple different ways that we can think about it. First of all, being compact means that every open cover of the set can be reduced down to a finite subcover. That's one way to think about it. The second way that we could think about compactness is that by Heine Burrell, compact means you're a closed bounded set. Okay, so we should probably remember both of those. So this is saying that if D is compact and F is continuous, then F of D is compact. And that's a pretty big result in real analysis, okay? So now we're ready to go ahead and work on proving uh, theorem 22.2. All right, so let me erase. And let's start our proof. Um, so first of all, again, we're working with sets and we know that D is compact. We're trying to show that F of D is compact, correct? So if we wanna show that F of D is compact, one way we could do that is start with an open cover of f of d 
and show that it can be reduced down to a finite subcover. And that's the strategy that we're going to take. So for the, to start this proof off, what I want to do is let's let, we'll call it script DG be equal to the set of all capital G sub alphas. Um, let that be an open cover of f of d. Now, if we could show that this cover has a finite subcover for any open cover, we're done, right? So that's the goal, is to show that g has a finite subcover. All right, so we need to show that uh, this family of sets G as a finite subcover. Okay, since we have that F is continuous on D, uh, theorem 21.14 implies for us that uh, for all open G in our set script G, there exists open, uh, by the way, instead of calling this just open G, it's true, but I'm just going to call it G sub alpha to really pinpoint that specific G. So if I take a specific open set in my family of open sets, then there exists an open, I'll call it H sub alpha, uh, such that H sub alpha intersect with D is equal to F inverse of G of alpha. Remember what we said is one of the definitions now of uh, being continuous is if I take an open set in the codomain, I can pull it back into the domain and what I will basically get is an open set intersected with the domain. So let's call that open set that intersects with the domain H sub alpha. Okay, so H sub alpha is a um, is an open set, you can kind of think it on the x-axis where G sub alphas are open sets in the y-axis. So we take a bunch of open sets in the y-axis, pull them back, and we get open sets in the x-axis, and we intersect those with D to get what we call F inverse of G sub alpha. Okay, so let's keep going. And since uh, F of D is a subset of the union over all G sub alphas, it follows that D is a subset of the union over all F inverse of G sub alpha, which of course is a subset of the union over all H sub alpha. Okay, so basically what we're seeing here is H sub alphas include H sub alpha intersect D because H sub alpha intersect D is a smaller set than H sub alpha. So we know that these guys are represented as H sub alpha intersect Ds, which are obviously a subset of the H sub alphas because H sub alpha intersect D is smaller than H sub alpha, right? So what I have here is that D is a subset of the union of the H sub alphas. But if D is an 
a subset of the union of the H sub alphas, what were the H sub alphas? A bunch of open sets. So the H sub alphas become an open cover of D. But D we know something about. D was a compact set. So since D is a compact set, and here we have an open cover, this guy, this set of open sets, can be reduced down to a finite subcover. Okay, so let's write this down. So that tells us that the set of all H sub alphas is an open cover of D since D is compact, there exists a bunch of uh, just finitely many of the H's, H sub alpha 1, H sub alpha 2, H sub alpha 3, and so on up to H sub alpha n, such that um, the set of all H sub alpha sub I, where I is going from 1 to n, is an open cover of D. So we had a cover, we reduced it down to a finite subcover because D is a compact set. Okay, very good. So we could write that D is a subset of H sub alpha sub one, union H sub alpha sub two, union H sub alpha sub three, union and so on, union H sub alpha sub n, right? Uh, D is certainly in there because that's our finite open cover. So we could say that D is a subset of H sub alpha sub one intersect with D union H sub alpha sub two intersect with D union H sub alpha sub three intersect D and so on to H sub alpha sub N uh, intersect with D. Now, why is that? Well, certainly uh, if it lives inside of each of uh, this union, it lives in this union intersect with itself, but then I just distribute that intersection and I get that line. Okay, very good. So we could, so to speak, take the functional value of both sides. We could take F of both sides of that inclusion. If I do on the left side, I say that F of D uh, is certainly a subset of F of each of those sets individually, right? But F of H sub alpha sub one intersect D, that's just also known as G sub alpha sub one. And F of H sub alpha sub two intersect D is just known as G sub alpha sub two and so on. So this is G sub alpha sub n. So what I just said is that F of D is a subset of finitely many open sets that were in the original family script G. So I took that script G open cover and I just reduced it down to a finite subcover, but that's exactly what it means for F of D to be a compact set. So I can say, thus, uh, the set G sub alpha sub one, G sub alpha sub two, and so on, G sub alpha sub n is a finite subcover 
of uh, d, uh, f of d, and therefore f of d is compact. And that's what we wanted to show. Okay, so we were able to show that uh, if D is compact and F is continuous, then F of D is also compact. And it's interesting always to ask the question, well, where did we use the fact that it was continuous? Okay, and maybe stop for a second and ask yourself that question. And the place that we used that it was a continuous function is we said, this line right here, that H sub alpha intersect D is equal to F inverse of G sub alpha. And that was one of the definitions of continuity, right? Okay, very good. Uh, that brings us to a corollary. Okay, so this is corollary. Oops. Corollary 22.3. Uh, and it says, let D uh, be a compact subset. of R, and suppose that F from D to R is continuous, then F assumes a uh, minimum and maximum values uh, on D. That is, uh, there exists points X1 and x2 such that f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of x2 uh, for all x and d. All right, this is sort of a big deal, this little corollary. Sometimes you kind of think of the theorems as the big deal. But sometimes a corollary is a big deal because there's not a lot to prove once you've proved a bunch of other stuff. This one just happens to be one of those big deals. And uh, sometimes in calculus, we call this the extreme value theorem. Typically in calculus, this is presented over just a closed interval. But the thing is, a closed interval is closed and bounded, thus compact. Now, any compact subset of R will do. It doesn't have to be a closed interval. But what this is saying is that if you have some nice compact subset of R and a continuous function, it's got to be continuous, then we get that F assumes its max and its min over that interval. That doesn't have to be true in general. But if you're on a compact subset and F is continuous, then it does. It always, there's some value that's the smallest value over the interval or set, and there's some value that is the biggest or the maximum. Okay, let's prove this real quick. So proof. So theorem 22.2 uh, told us that F of D is compact, right? So we know that F of D is compact. Well, how is that helpful? So lemma 
14.4 uh, says that f of d has a maximum and a minimum. Okay, so f of d itself has a max and a min, so we could call them uh, y1 and y2. So let's say that y1 is the maximal value and y2 is the minimal value. Okay, uh, since uh, y1 and y2 both are elements of f of d. Um, there exists x1 and x2 that live in d such that um, f of x1 is equal to y1 and f of x2 is equal to y2. In other words, uh, we have, therefore, um, so we said that y1 was the max. So we have that f of x2 is less than or equal to, oh, I guess I want, this is, uh, I wrote it, call them y1 and y2 as the max and the min. I, it's the other way around. So this is the max. This is the min just to keep everything consistent with what's written above. Then we have that uh, f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x, is less than or equal to f of x2 for all x in the domain. And that's what we wanted to show. So we're done. Okay, so this is really important. And that is that if we have a compact set that we have a continuous function over, then we know that f of d has a max and a min. And that's something we're gonna be able to use over and over again. Uh, an interesting question to ask yourself is, why isn't this true if it's not compact? So like, for example, what if you were dealing with an open interval, not a closed interval? Why would suddenly you don't have to have a max and a min anymore? So that's something I'll let you think about a little bit. Why do you not have to have a, a maximum and a minimum on f of d if like d were an open interval? Okay, think about that. Okay, so the next theorem that we have to cover is a lemma and it's such an important lemma. I, I almost can't stand to do it online like this. So I might just finish here so that on Friday we can talk together about this lemma. But basically, we're going to lay the groundwork for what we call the intermediate value theorem of calculus. Okay. And if if you don't remember the intermediate value theorem, it's basically saying if you have f of a and f of b and they differ and you have a continuous function that goes between the two, then the function takes on all the values in between. Okay, that's what we call the intermediate value theorem. The, theor uh, the lemma that I have to show you is foundational to proving the intermediate value theorem. So that's what we're going to start with on Friday and it will be fun, okay? We're really getting into some real calculus type proofs right now and that's fun. All right, well, thanks everybody for watching and I will see you all on Friday.